Always together, eternally apart. As long as the sun rises and sets, as long as there is day and night, and for as long as they both shall live. There's disturbing news, Your Grace. One of the prisoners has escaped. No one ever escapes from the dungeons of Aquila, Marquis. At any rate, Your Grace, it is only one insignificant petty thief. Great storms announce themselves to the simple breeze, Captain. Come on, Mouse. Keep going. And a single random spark can ignite the fires of rebellion. If he's out there, Your Grace, I shall find him. Innkeeper, a drink of your most expensive. And the same for anyone who will join me in a toast. Let's hear your toast. We drink to a special man, my friend. Someone who has been inside the dungeons of Aquila and lived to tell the tale. Get him. They got a bitch in my car! One of my men told me you returned. I wanted to cut his throat for lying, because I knew you were that stupid. Navarre has returned. The criminal, Gaston, travels with him. My men are combing the woods. And the hawk. Your grace? Must be a hawk. A spirited hawk. This hawk is not to be harmed. Is that understood? You see, the day she dies, a new captain of the guard will preside at your execution. I need you to guide me into the city. Not for the life of my mother, even if I knew who she was. You're the only one who has ever escaped from there. It was chance, pure chance, a miracle, once in a lifetime. There are strange forces at work in your life, magical ones that surround you. I don't understand them, but they frighten me. I have waited almost two years for a sign from God. I knew the moment of my destiny had come. You will be my guiding angel. She travels by night, only by night. Her son is the moon, and her name is... Isabeau. Find her and you find the wolf. The wolf I want. The wolf who loves her. Lady Hawk first arrived on the big screen in France on the 27th of March 1985. Come April the 10th it arrived in the UK and two days later it got its release in the USA. Produced on a relatively large budget for the time at $20 million, it unfortunately only managed to crawl back $18.4 million at the US box office. It's unclear how much it made worldwide but I'm guessing based on how the movie has been treated by its respected distributors over the years it probably didn't set the world alight. The director Richard Donner in an interview back in 1985 said it was a difficult film to market, stating I didn't know how to sell this movie. It isn't sword and sorcery, it isn't a comedy, it's a medieval action adventure love story with humour. It encompasses so many things. The 80s were very much dominated by sword and sorcery fantasy adventure movies, with most of them failing to generate any decent profit at the box office at the time, but despite many falling by the wayside, studios were still confident in the genre. Lady Hawk came out at the height of the fantasy boom and did receive strong reviews from critics, especially Gene Siskel, and come the Oscars of 1986 it was nominated for Best Sound and Best Sound Editing, but lost out to Out of Africa and Back to the Future. Lauren Schuller and the Alan Ladd Company had been wanting to get Lady Hawk off the ground for a number of years and wanted Richard Donner involved. He was sent three scripts back in the early 80s by Lauren Schuller. Two were comedies and one was Lady Hawk, written by first-time writer Edward Kamara, who went on to write Enemy Mine. Donner felt that the idea of Lady Hawk was interesting, but that the script was weak. There was just one part that made him commit to it, when the old monk explains to cursed lovers. He loved that aspect and felt at its core it was a beautiful love story. He signed on as director but told Alan Ladd Jr. the script needed a major rewrite. The original script had lots of monsters in it, which Donna felt was unbelievable and wanted the audience to believe in the love story. 
Verisimilitude is what Dick Donner likes to bring to his movies, such as Superman. He wants the audience to believe in what's happening on screen. He hired David Peoples, who contributed to Blade Runner, and Michael Thomas, who wrote The Hunger, to redraft the original script to Donner's tastes. But he still wasn't totally satisfied and brought on his close friend Tom Mankiewicz, who wrote Superman 1 and 2, to add more humour and enhance the love story. Donner revealed in an interview with Starlog magazine that he felt bad for changing a lot of Edward's script, and Donner never heard from him once the production started moving forward. Alan Ladd's company was having financial difficulties and couldn't finance the movie, so Donner took on producing duties with Lauren Schuller, and Warner Brothers handled the distribution of the movie for the US market, and 20th Century Fox picked up the foreign rights. Donner spent a year on and off travelling through most of Europe that still had existing castles and towns available to give the movie its medieval style, and Italy seemed to have it all. Cinecita Studios was anxious to get the production set up there. Originally, Dick Donner wanted Sean Connery to play Navarre and Dustin Hoffman to play Philippe, which he thought would be a great double act, but he knew it would have increased the film's budget and it would be impossible to have both actors attached. They decided to go with Dustin Hoffman and Kurt Russell as Navarre. Dustin, who had shown an interest in the role, bowed out four weeks before any shooting commenced, which caused some trouble, but problems arose with Kurt Russell. Kurt was getting cold feet while out in Italy. He didn't like the costume and helmet he had to wear, and was missing his new wife, Goldie Horn, and wanted to go home and quit the production. Rutger Hauer had originally been offered the role of Maquette, the head of the Bishop's Guard, but he didn't want to play the villain. He told Donna if he changed his mind on needing another lead, he was game. Lauren Schuller suggested maybe he could play Navarre, because they needed another big actor involved quickly, before the studio got cold feet. Rutger accepted the part and drove from Holland to Italy in two days. Michelle Pfeiffer was put forward to play Isabeau, after Donna liked her performance in Greece too. She didn't get a chance to meet Richard Donner, but sent a videotape with her audition, providing a very comical performance as she read her lines and cut into a parakeet on a chair to fill in for the hawk. Donna thought she nailed it and gave her the part. They felt the part of Philippe should pass on to a younger actor, and Matthew Broderick was offered the part. He had a lot of experience in theatre and recent success in war games, making the movie appeal to younger viewers. Originally, the part of the bishop was going to be played by Mick Jagger. Donna got a phone call from his agent saying he had a strange offer and suggested Jagger for the role. Donna thought it was a joke. He said his accent wouldn't be right for the role, but he eventually spoke to Jagger and he put on a mid-European accent, which totally surprised Donna. There wasn't a hint of Mick Jagger in his voice. Richard and Lauren decided he would be great and took the idea to Warner Brothers, who were just as enthusiastic, but 20th Century Fox, who were putting up the money for the foreign rights, highly disagreed and said they would pull out if Mick Jagger was cast, so Donna had to turn him down and John Wood took on the role. Donna said John was wonderful in the part, but Mick Jagger would have made it an incredible picture. As the Ladyhawk project developed, Richard Donna and Lauren Schuller became close friends. Lauren was married at the time, and when they got halfway into production, Lauren and Richard's feelings became stronger, and she and her husband decided to split. Lauren and Richard became a couple, and less than a year later after shooting, they got married. With the movie dealing with a love story, it seems that even behind the scenes, there was romance brewing. For the cast of Ladyhawk, we have Rutger Hauer as Captain Navarre. Originally the head of the guard, he went into hiding with Isabeau, who he had fallen in love with. The bishop was furious to find out about their love, and put a curse on the couple out of jealousy. Michelle Pfeiffer plays Isabeau. She comes to live in Aquila after her father dies fighting in the Crusades. All who saw her fell in love with her, including the bishop. Isabeau kept her relationship with Navarre secret, fearing the anger of others, but was let down when she revealed her passion for Navarre to a priest she thought she could trust. Matthew Broderick plays Philippe Gaston, who is nicknamed the Mouse. Philippe has been stealing all his life and is very much alone and having no knowledge of his parents. He reluctantly agrees to help Navarre in his mission, due to being the only person to escape from the bishop's dungeon. The late John Wood, who starred alongside Matthew in War Games, plays the evil bishop of Aquila. He rules over the land and puts the curse on Navarre and Isabeau, due to his insane jealousy and love for her. If he can't have her, no one can. The late Leo McKern, who Donna also cast in The Omen, plays the exiled monk Imperius. He lets slip of Navarre and Isabeau's romance to the bishop. In his guilt, he left and went into hiding, but returns to redeem himself. Ken Hutchinson, a big star of British TV, plays Marquette, the head of the guards, who the bishop uses to hunt down Philippe. 
And last but not least, we have the talented Alfred Molina, playing Caesar the Wolf Catcher, who is hired by the bishop to hunt down Navarre when he turns into the wolf by night. The movie opens with Philippe escaping from the dungeon of Aquila. He was thrown into prison for pickpocketing and is planned to be executed. The corrupt Bishop of Aquila is informed of his escape and is furious. No one has escaped before and he sends out his guard to hunt him down. Philippe makes his way through the dense forest, pinching some money and clothes along the way. He celebrates his escape but is unaware the guards have tracked him down. They try to apprehend Philippe but are prevented by a mysterious black knight who reveals himself to be their former captain, Navarre. He saves Philippe and escapes with him. Marquette rides back to Aquila to warn the Bishop of Navarre's return, but he is only interested in the hawk that accompanies him. The Bishop makes it clear that no harm should befall the hawk in their apprehension of Navarre and Philippe. As they rest overnight, Philippe is saved from a murderer by a giant black wolf that appears from nowhere. Spurred by fear, Philippe attempts to shoot the wolf, but is stopped by a beautiful blonde woman who mysteriously greets the wolf as though they are old friends. The next morning, Navarre seeks Philippe's help in sneaking inside Aquila. Philippe reluctantly agrees to help as recompense for Navarre saving his own life. The bishop's knights catch up to them, but during their escape, the hawk gets wounded. Philippe is told to take her to the old priest Imperius, and come the night, it is revealed that the hawk is Isabeau, as she appears with a crossbow arrow through her left breast. Imperius tells the sad story of Isabeau and Navarre's love, and how each were cursed to become a hawk and a wolf. They would always be together, but eternally apart. But Imperius thinks he has found a way to break this curse. Lady Hawk incorporates a very few visual effects. Whilst most fantasy movies of the time were all big visual effects extravaganzas, such as the Dark Crystal and Krull, but Lady Hawk goes in the opposite direction. The idea of transforming a human into a wolf can be done, which was executed with class in American Werewolf in London. But with Lady Hawk being a family friendly movie, you obviously couldn't do that without terrifying the children watching it. So the movie just incorporates a very cheap jump cut or a series of optical dissolves intercut with images. For example, when Isabeau transforms into the Hawk. Now, if they'd attempted to do something in miniature form, or animated a hawk transforming into a human, the results were guaranteed to look very dated today, and it still would have been a huge challenge at the time, so I understand their approach with simple optical effects. There are other transitions in the film as you see their eyes transform, but that's really the furthest they go in showing you the changes. There are other moments of visual effects, for example, as you see the moon past the sun causing an eclipse. Richard Greenberg provides the unique opening credits. He designed the credit sequence on Superman the Movie and Alien. Nothing is particularly memorable or exciting with its visual effects, I'm sorry to say, but they do successfully help tell the story, which is most important. Lady Hawk's score was composed by Andrew Powell and produced by Alan Parsons. It has been hit with a lot of criticism over the years. When the movie starts, it has traditional orchestral cues, but then it kicks into full synth mode with jazz slash rock infused music. If you listen to the score isolated by itself and not with the picture, it's really good, but when you see it synced with the film, it's a funny experience. It seems like a massive tonal shift. Richard Donner is playing it very straight with the story, but then you have this pop-like synth score thrown over the top it's like you are watching a different film. It was a contemporary approach. Never Ending Story did it with great success the year before, but when you apply that approach to Lady Hawk, it seems out of place. Now the score isn't just pop music throughout. It does dial it back to orchestral pieces of music and it works wonderfully. When you hear these moments, you think, why didn't they do that for the rest of the score? I think if composer Andrew Powell scaled back the synth melodies and pushed the orchestra to the forefront of the sound mix, the movie would have received less of a backlash. Rudger Hauer in more recent interviews admitted he wasn't too crazy about the music, but understood the idea and direction of it. Dick Donner and Lauren Schuller expressed people were against the musical direction at the time, but they wanted to take a gamble and they feel it paid off, because people are still talking about the score to this day, for good or bad. Richard Donner stated that he was listening to the Alan Parsons project on which Powell collaborated while scouting for locations and became unable to separate his visual ideas from the music. He originally thought about getting John Williams or Jerry Goldsmith to provide the score, but they were both unavailable. So Donner approached Andrew Powell and Alan Parsons 
and they both agreed to provide the music. A soundtrack album was released in 1985 on LP and tape. It got re-released with nine additional tracks in 1995. It wasn't until February 2015 that a two-disc remastered set was released from La La Land Records. It includes previously unreleased music and bonus tracks. It was limited to 3,000 copies, but thankfully it's still available to purchase. I personally would recommend you get it before it finally sells out. To me, the music really gives off that vibe of 90s video game music. If you like the jazzy soundtrack to Guardian Heroes on the Sega Saturn, then this would be perfect for you. Ladyhawk sadly wasn't part of my youth. I don't ever recall seeing it on TV or even to rent at my local video store. It totally went under my radar for years. It wasn't until I was searching for other movies in Richard Donner's catalogue of films that I stumbled across Ladyhawk. I watched a few clips online and it seemed interesting, so I tried to hunt it down on DVD, but had no luck finding it. It seemed out of print. Eventually I stumbled across the Blu-ray a couple of years later and finally got to watch it in full. Now the film starts out kind of like you've missed the intro. Philippe is already escaping and then as he flees he bumps into Navarre and during the course of their adventure he finds out about the curse and how he can help break it. This is a pretty straightforward story, but you have a sense of missing the start of it. You have little introduction to these characters aside from being told who they are later on. You can tell it's set in Italy from the locations, but there is no attempt to say where the story is set or the time. You just have to make a guess and think, well, it's going to be in the 12th or 13th century. Even though it goes against the idea of what Donna was trying to do, it would have been interesting to see it open with a book and with a narrator telling us about the love story and thus setting up this world. I think it would have benefited the story to have a simple fairy tale opening. It's not an original idea, but sometimes it helps to go with something tried and tested. The film is played very straight for the most part, which I think in hindsight works against it. We have moments of comedy from Philippe, who talks to himself kind of like he is talking directly to the audience. He doesn't look directly into the camera to break the fourth wall like in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but it leans the movie away from its serious direction. I think if Richard Donner kept the fancy elements from the original screenplay in, such as the big monsters, then the character of Philippe would have seemed quite normal within that world. Personally, before I saw the film, I thought it would have more magic thrown in and been a little crazier perhaps, because I'd become quite used to that with fantasy movies of the 80s, and seeing a straightforward love story was surprising, but a little underwhelming. I think with its constant script rewrites, it's become this slightly uneven movie, as it battles to play it straight, but also needs those fantasy elements to give it more life. Its length is very problematic. It's two hours long, and the story doesn't really need to be told at that length. There are moments where the plot is not moving along and it just becomes baggy. It does sometimes work in its favour and gives more breathing time for Navarre, Isabeau and Philippe. So the audience get to know them and care about them, which is key. The filmmakers want you to care about the romance and you kind of do, but to be honest I felt more invested in the friendship of Navarre and Philippe. We never get to see Navarre and Isabeau together because of the curse and we are only told about how much they're in love but we don't get to see them interact until the very end. Here is where the audience would benefit from having a stronger opening, where we get to see them in some sort of flashback on how they met, etc. It would have helped in strengthening the romance. The cast all seem really invested in the script, and you get a great sense they are performing to the best of their abilities. Two actors really made the film stand out for me. One was Marquette, played by Ken Hutchinson. His performance felt so controlled and serious. You get a real sense of his bitterness towards Navarre and the respect the guards still have for him. It surprised me that Ken didn't get used in other big movies and went quickly back into TV. He had a strong presence on screen and makes for a great villain. Rugger is on top form in this movie, totally cool and calm throughout, and difficult to read as he holds back a lot of his emotions until the very end. There are flourishes of him displaying the passion he has for Isabeau, as I mentioned earlier about those moments between Philippe and Navarre being more interesting than the actual love story. It's seeing Ruger really becoming this father figure to Philippe, or an older brother friendship. At one point, Navarre is frustrated with Philippe. Pushing him to the ground, he notices the scars on his chest and wants to know how that happened. Imperius says Navarre did it the night before, when he was a wolf, as Philippe tried to save him. This is a great bonding moment between the two as Navarre is very apologetic, further enforcing their friendship. Matthew Broderick and Michelle Pfeiffer for the most part do a fine job with their respective roles. With both of them being American and not really attempting to change their accents, 
you could argue they feel a bit out of place when everyone else is either English or European, but with a movie financed by American distributors, they're going to want American actors involved, because they tend to have this absurd idea that American viewers won't be interested, which is crazy. I think honestly Matthew would probably be the odd one out despite me quite liking him as an actor. You could easily swap him out with some British comedic actor. Philippe is intended to be the comic relief. They could have thrown in Dudley Moore at the time or one of the Pythons. The sword battle at the end is very well choreographed and comes across as a realistic fight. It doesn't look too staged, there is a natural flow to it. You can see the swords are really heavy as they swing them in battle. And you see it all in long takes, shot in glorious cinema scope. This is always the beauty of Richard Donner. He always works wonders with the scope format. Shots are wonderfully framed and there is plenty of blocking as you watch the creative camera moves as Donner plays out the scenes in long, unbroken takes. Donner is a great old school director. The film is photographed by one of the most highly respected and influential cameramen, Vittorio Storaro, who shot Last Tango in Paris, Apocalypse Now, The Last Emperor and Dick Tracy. Now all these movies have distinctive looks and generally for the most part are lush in their visuals. But Lady Hawk doesn't quite match the high standards I come to expect from Vittorio. Of course there is great epic vistas and interesting uses of filters to give the image this warm red glow and there are many great shots that exhibit a soft hazy style to the photography but for me personally there was nothing that really grabbed my attention to say wow that looks stunning. The photography was in keeping to make everything as believable as much as possible and in keeping with Donna's direction. If the DP pushed the colours more then it would have moved the visual design into the fantasy genre. Lady Hawk is a competently made film. It has lots of talented people in front of the camera and behind the camera, but it just lacks the punch and entertainment value to make it something special for me. It is by no means a bad movie or a fantastic one. It falls right in the middle of being satisfying, but not something I would put next to the high quality standards of Conan the Barbarian or Excalibur. My views may be a result of it not being part of my childhood, and it's a shame it wasn't brought to my attention earlier on. I appreciate and acknowledge there is good stuff in it, but it's clear it didn't hit the mark when it came out, and even Warner Brothers and 20th Century Fox don't really care about the movie. It's just been given the standard treatment for its home video release, an HD master and an old crusty trailer attached as a special feature. So very generous of them. If you are a fan of director Richard Donner and the cast involved, definitely give it a go. You may get more fun out of it than I did, and it would be interesting to see what people think of the soundtrack. It's certainly something that has grown on me, but I'm fully aware it has lots of haters. Lady Hawk is a fun movie that I believe should have stuck to its fantasy roots. That could have elevated the film and may have gained it more fans at the time, and possibly grabbed my attention when I was younger. I shall never forget the first time I saw her. It was like looking at... The face of love. Ah, oh, you too. Even his grace, the bishop, could think of nothing else. The bishop loved her? As near as that evil man could come to it. His passion was a sort of madness. He was a man possessed. But Isabeau sensed his wickedness and she shrank from him. Her heart was already lost, you see the captain of the guard. Etienne de Vaughan. The bishop knew nothing of their love, but every day saw it grow stronger and deeper and richer. So Navarre and Isabeau fled from Aquila. But the bishop followed, never more than an hour behind and more persistent than a hound. An evil man, a powerful man, hated and feared, rejected even by Rome herself. He called upon the powers of darkness for the means to damn the lovers. In his fury and frustration, he struck a dreadful bargain. The dark powers of hell spat up a terrible curse, and you have seen it working. By day, his abode is the beautiful bird you brought to me. And by night, as you have already guessed, the voice of the wolf that we hear is the cry of Navarre. Three days hence, the bishop will hear the confession of the clergy in the cathedral in Aquila. All you have to do is confront him. Both of you as man and woman in the flesh. And the curse will be confounded. 
broken, and both of you will be free! Impossible. As long as there is night and day, no. But three days hence, in Aquila, there will be a day without a night, and a night without a day. There's no time left. The mass will be over soon. I cannot wait for you now. If Philippe has done his job, I can kill the bishop now or never. But kill me, Navarre. And the curse will go on forever. Look at her! If you enjoyed the video, you can find more on my YouTube channel, and also you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to help support the channel, you can donate through Patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel, early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on YouTube. Even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going. Thank you.